welcome everyone to our webinar. We thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us and to learn about a very important endeavor, which is ending HIV. Uh, I will be your uh, moderator today. My name is Paris Mullen, and I am, a, uh, <clears throat> I am a Martin Delaney Collaboratory CAB representative, as well as a Defeat HIV CAB rep. There you can see my picture if you ever wanted to know what I look like. I think that's a great picture of me, by the way. Um, that's just me. Those are my inside thoughts coming out. That won't happen much here on this call, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here today. So what is HIV and who, or Defeat HIV and who is Defeat HIV? Defeat HIV, the Delaney Cell and Gen Genome Engineering in Initiative, is a consortium of committed investigators found in both academic and private sector research institutions, working together for a common purpose, to eradicate HIV. Our core technologies utilize the latest cell and genome engineering approaches to create HIV-resistant cells for transplant and to seek out and destroy HIV in its hiding places throughout the body. It is our mission to leverage the knowledge, expertise, and resources of the consortium to generate a realistic and promising pathway toward the ultimate goal of an HIV cure. At this time, I'd like to also welcome and acknowledge our DARE and CARE CAB representatives that are on the call. We thank you so much for uh, participating today. We know that you begin these types of educational calls, and we thank you so much for uh, forging the way forward with us here today, and we're really happy to be working with you as one of the three uh, collaboratories here. So with regard to our agenda today, we have scheduled the two co-principal investigators leading Defeat HIV. Dr. Keith, Dr. Hans Peter Keem and Keith Jerome. They're going to give us an overview and update on the research being conducted here in Seattle on the dual strategies. Number one, to create HIV resistant cells for transplant, and number two, to seek out and destroy HIV in its hiding places throughout the body. Before we go on with that, I'd like to share with you some quick announcements that we have for you. Number one, if you'd love to like to learn more about Defeat HIV and like us, please go to our Facebook page there at www.facebook.com backslash Defeat HIV Seattle. As well, the Defeat HIV CAB community representatives are hosting an event called Word on a HIV Cure. And this is going to be an update for community about our search for an HIV cure here in Seattle. It's going to be held at our Miller Community Center on January 14, 2014. Uh, it's obviously 7 p.m. to 8, uh, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Secondly, a cabaret for a cause. This is an event held in conjunction with Jinx Monsoon and Fred Hutchinson to, do, to end HIV. And as some of you may know, Jinx Monsoon won RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, she is a native of Seattle, and we are proud to work with her uh, in this effort here. This event will take place in December next month on the 18th at our Moore Theater, uh, 7.30 p.m. The Hedwig and the Angry Inch Benefit performance we'll be having as well. There will be a VIP cabaret following. If you want more information on this and the other things I had mentioned, please do not hesitate to contact Michael, Michael Luella. He is Defeat HIV's CAB coordinator. He can be reached at 206 667 5810. And lastly, a uh, few housekeeping rules here. Um, we invite questions at any period, any time throughout uh, the presentation today. We would just ask that you would uh, uh, ask that you'd be excused, identify that you'd like to ask a question off your first name, the city, and then your question. Please do not hesitate to ask questions. This is a dialogue today, not merely a monologue. With regard to muting, uh, we cannot mute uh, our line here, so we please ask that you keep the noise at a minimum um, at your location. Also, this webinar is being recorded. We'd like to just uh, give you a heads up on that. And this will be available after the fact on YouTube and the Defeat HIV website. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our PIs for Defeat HIV. First, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Keith Jerome. He is a co-PI for Defeat HIV, as I mentioned, as well an associate member in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division at Fred Hutchinson. Also, he's a professor uh, and head of viro uh, virology division uh, in the Department of Laboratory Science at the University of Washington. Dr. Keith Jerome. 
Okay, thank you, Paris. It's a pleasure to um, get to speak with uh, everybody today. These things are a lot of fun, and I want to reiterate, first of all, what Paris said, that this is a lot more enjoyable for me and hopefully for everybody if we do make this a little bit interactive. So, um, you know, I can't see your body language if you have a question. Sometimes I can see people are getting excited and I can call on them. But um, so just speak up, and, and uh, Tom or somebody will poke me if I'm rambling on, and we'll... Uh, We'll uh, get to your questions. Um, otherwise, we'll zip through this pretty quick, so um, don't be shy. I want to spend the first couple of minutes just introducing you to um, Defeat HIV and how we think about HIV cure in sort of a general sense. Um, and then as we get into the science, I'm going to hand things off to my colleague, Hans Peter Keem, uh, who will explain some of our um, uh, our studies that are going on right now and are incredibly exciting in transplantation other stuff, and then finally Hans Peter will hand things back to me and we'll talk a little bit about where we're going in the future. So I think you guys all know that, that we're really facing quite a challenge here when we think about curing HIV. The virus uh, infects very long-lived cells in the body, the memory T cells that, that really last a lifetime and remember all the infections that you've had in childhood and, and can help protect, those, uh, protect you from those throughout life. And by usurping those cells, the virus has a hiding place. Um, then those cells tend to go to places where medications have a hard time going, lymph node and, and lymphoid tissue in the gut. And maybe most, uh, most difficult for those of us thinking about cure is the virus then integrates itself into the chromosomes. It becomes part of the chromosome of, of the infected cells. Um, and so for all these reasons, it's really a challenge when you think about how you might cure this. Um, and when we were facing this challenge, and I think you guys all know this, that this, this challenge is really bigger than any one of us. Uh, it's really going to take scientists and community members and volunteers all working together to try to do this. So I'd love to show just a couple of pictures. These are, this is a map of science, and, and, and essentially what happens is that when we do a study, anybody in science does a study with anybody in another city, you draw a line. And I think this is kind of fun only because it shows how much the world is really interactive to try to face the challenges, not just HIV, but all the challenges we face in medicine. Uh, many of those lines would be for HIV. Um, I also like to show this because it shows that the United States is not the center of the universe, and I think it's a good reality check for us. You can do that for the United States. Um, and for those of us up in the uh, upper left corner, as we like to think of ourselves, um, you know, we know we're not in the center of things. But again, as you can see, we're, we're collaborating. And I think that this web of collaboration uh, is really what's going to make us move forward and, and ultimately, I think, end this, uh, this disease. Based on their understanding of this same principle, a couple of years ago, as you know, the National Institutes of Health um, requested proposals for collaboratories of scientists um, to focus on a cure for HIV. Um, these are the Martin Delaney collaboratories, and I'm sure you guys all know uh, of Martin Delaney or, or his legacy. Um, and uh, essentially, the, the original idea was to fund uh, one or two of these, and the NIH set aside about $40 million. But I think there was actually really an overwhelming response to this, um, not only from the scientists, but also, I think, from the community and from people saying, yes, this needs to be a priority. And ultimately, uh, the NIH funded three collaboratories, uh, and, and we've got each of those listed here, and, and, and of course, all of, all of you are on the call. Um, and, and, and the NIH ended up putting an extra $30 million into this. I think we're now budgeted at about $70 million baseline, and we've actually found some more for supplements to each of the collaboratories I know. Um, so it's a very uh, encouraging thing that we have these groups of, of investigators really working toward a common cause. And as you know, we'll all be getting together in just a couple of weeks now uh, really to share uh, each of our insights and ways that we might help each other, because we are all pulling toward a common goal. So we'll all be in Miami, and I know some of you will be there as well uh, to, to help us with that. One beautiful thing about having three collaboratories is that uh, we're really able to cover most of the the ideas that people can contemplate in how one might cure HIV. And I've sort of listed them here in no particular order, but we certainly have heard about the Mississippi uh, babies and the idea of maybe an intense early therapy can, can uh, maybe 
cure some people before the infections maybe got a chance, chance to completely uh, set up uh, uh, fully in the body. Um, I know our, our colleagues in North, in the, in the uh, North Carolina group, uh, CARE, are, are very interested in reactivating the latent virus uh, to let it uh, replication using HDAC inhibitors or other approaches. I think everybody's interested in immune modulation in, in the various collaboratories, and I think uh, DARES especially got uh, some really interesting ideas there. Um, and, and, and so the idea is perhaps through these approaches one could eliminate the latently infected cells. And then a couple of other ideas that, that our collaboratory has been especially interested in. Um, one is the idea of replacing the susceptible immune system, the immune system that HIV is, is able to infect. Perhaps that could be is there, is there a question? Okay, no. Um, perhaps we could replace the susceptible immune system with something that's resistant. And so we'll talk about how that, how that happened and Hans Peter will, will, will fill you in on that. And then we'll wrap up with something that my laboratory has been very interested in, which is the idea that perhaps we could specifically remove or inactivate the integrated virus from its hiding places without necessarily doing any harm to the host cell. So when we set up Defeat HIV, we really thought hard about what do investigators here in Seattle do well. We thought we had a couple of strengths that we could contribute to this effort. Um, between the Fred Hutch, which is the lead organization, the University of Washington and Seattle Children's, we've had a lot of expertise in hematopoietic cell transplantation. Um, uh, really, some of our colleagues have been real leaders in genome engineering. Um, and then a lot of expertise in sequencing and HIV sequence analysis. We partnered with a couple of other, um, uh, a couple of other institutions, City of Hope and Sangama Biosciences, as our industrial partner. Uh, and really came up with a project that is comprised of five projects and five cores that Hans Peter and I lead. But one thing we were very proud of is that the projects and the cores are very, very interactive. So just like that map that you saw of the world or, or, or the United States, our projects and cores really work together closely, and we're very proud of that. We have a very integrated uh, effort that we're trying to do. So I mentioned that the idea of transplantation is one of our uh, really, um, excuse me, sorry, Dr. Jerome, okay. there's some noise in the background. Uh, if we could keep the noise at a minimum, it kind of uh, inhibits us, everyone here in Curly. So I don't know where it's coming from, okay. not asking, but if we could. Uh, okay. There's some noise in the background. It sounds like there's uh, folks speaking in the background. If we could kind of keep that at a minimum, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paris. So the other enabling technology besides uh, transplantation are uh, a series of tools that we're going to use for genome engineering, and these are known as rare cutting endonucleases. And so I think at this point, with that little bit of introduction of, of transplant and endonucleases and, and what we're trying to do clinically, I want to hand this over to Hans Peter, who will tell you about some of our uh, latest studies. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerome. And now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Hans Peter Keem. Jose Carreras and E. Donald Thomas Endowed Chair for Cancer Research, full member, Clinical Research Division at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and Professor of Medicine, Professor of Pathology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Keem is also the Associate Head of the Transplantation Biology Program. And as we mentioned before, he is a co-PI with Dr. Keith Jerome at Defeat HIV. Dr. Hunt. Well, thank you very much, um, Paris, and thanks, Keith, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, everyone, on the call. Uh, let me see if I can advance. This. Wonderful. Okay. This is a uh, wonderful Seattle hero. <laughs> on Vernier in the back. <laughs> it does not look like that today. No, it is, it's cloudy and rainy. <laughs> and, and this is what we're doing here. <laughs> so this is our, our first slide, our goals and our rationale. So a big part, as you've already heard, is uh, that we're interested in hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplantation as a platform for purging the latent uh, HIV reservoir. Um, as part of this um, is uh, that we're interested in, in the genetic modification of blood stem cells and marrow stem cells to make them resistant to HIV and then to have a, a resistant immune and blood system eventually. 
And then, as uh, Keith already mentioned, disruption of the integrated uh, HIV virus, and he will talk more about that part. So I'll focus mostly on the transplantation aspects. The U19, um, so our collaboratory consists of, um, as you've heard, five projects and five cores. I'd just like to briefly introduce the five projects, at least, as you can see, project one. Uh, up there, led by Dr. Wolfrey, uh, where we're looking at the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as a platform for purging. This in incorporates autologous and allogeneic uh, stem cell transplantation. And then project two is our uh, industry partner, Sangamo. Uh, they're developing uh, zinc finger technology to specifically um, knock down the CCR5 um, doorway for HIV. And then uh, project three, uh, we will demonstrate then that we can in indeed hopefully replace the blood and immune system with uh, CCR5 disrupted um, um, blood and marrow stem cells. And then you'll hear more from uh, Keith about uh, uh, project four and then uh, also about uh, project five, uh, the City of Hope project uh, where we will study the to, uh, ways to deliver the zinc fingers and endonucleases to infected cells. Okay. So, very famous picture, and Timothy has now been uh, discussed for many years. Uh, just as a way of background, um, as most of you know, uh, Timothy had um, HIV uh, and um, acute myeloid leukemia uh, several years back now. Um, he was uh, fortunate that um, he, um, in, in that situation, had a physician who was also looking out for a particular donor, a donor that was CCR5 uh, negative, um, therefore not infectable by uh, HIV. Uh, and he received this transplant uh, from such a donor um, after chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy uh, conditioning. Uh, and as uh, all of you know, he has remained now uh, fortunately free of uh, acute myeloid leukemia and um, of uh, HIV. Now, while this is um, obviously a procedure that um, can be done and, and uh, was uh, successful in Timothy, I'd just like to walk through this uh, proce procedure, how it works in general. So we have a donor for an allogeneic transplant. We can take these um, either marrow stem cells, we harvest the, the marrow from the hip bones, or we can mobilize the marrow stem cells into the blood and simply collect them via a leukophoresis or apheresis, it's called, uh, from the blood. So those are the same uh, stem cells that we collect. And then uh, we can simply infuse those um, marrow and blood stem cells into the patient. So if the patient has a leukemia um, and, for example, now HIV, then uh, after conditioning with chemotherapy typically um, and or radiation therapy, we infuse the donor cells and then these cells can engraft and establish a um, new blood and immune system, and obviously if the donor is CCR5 negative, that immune system would be also HIV resistant, so, uh, in the, like in the case um, with Timothy um, Brown. Now, while we know this can work, um, there is a, a number of potential side effects and complications involved. This is not a trivial procedure. It's obviously also very difficult to find such a unique match, meaning CCR5 negative and tissue typed match um, for, for the patient. But there's also significant uh, potential complications involved. So currently, we, we only uh, do this and recommend this for patients uh, with a, a malignant uh, blood cancer, for example, leukemia or lymphoma, uh, um, to, to do this type of uh, transplant. Now, some of these complications, again, all revolve around the graft versus host uh, disease. That means the graft is other donor cells, they can attack the host. Uh, and then they can usually attack the skin, the gut, and the liver, and these uh, can be quite severe, these, these attacks, uh, and they can, in fact, uh, also result in the death of patients. Uh, therefore, again, this is not something that we, uh, that is a very uh, a trivial procedure. It, is, it, it can involve uh, significant side effects. Then, in most cases, patients do need to undergo or receive immunosuppression, which, again, and potentially complicate the outcome and, and result in infectious disease complications. Um, again, or complications from the 
conditioning regimens. Now, when we knew all about this at the time when we wrote our Defeat HIV Collaboratory, we thought, well, if we could do this all in the patient's own cells, then we could avoid all these complications, obviously. And this is really was a, a big part of our collaboratory. We said, well, we've got all the engineering here, we've got all the deal with transplantation. Now, if we can, could just take the patient's own cells and make the patient's own cells resistant to HIV, then we could avoid all these side effects that uh, I'm just listen, uh, listing right here on this slide. So how does that work then? Again, that's a big part of um, what we're trying to accomplish here. So here now we've got the patient. Uh, we take now the patient's own marrow or, again, uh, mobilized uh, marrow stem cells and just simply mobilized into the blood. Now these stem cells, we, we can now isolate them in the tissue culture dish once we take them out. Um, and then we can simply take either a, a vector, a lentiviral vector, for example, or these uh, nucleases that uh, Keith was just showing you, and make these, get these right into these stem cells, and then make these stem cells, and, and that what you just saw back there, we can actually target very specifically now this CCR5 locus, a sp specific locus on, in the chromosome and knock out that CCR5 I, that is the doorway for HIV. Uh, so we can also potentially expand these cells and then reinfuse the cells in uh, the patient. Uh, him or herself, uh, and therefore, again, there would be no graft versus host type reaction. Now then, if we do this with stem cells up there, the cells renewing stem cells that you see uh, on top, we then put that uh, resistance gene into that self renewing stem cell, and as you can see, that stem cell now makes all these other cells, all in, in, including all the cells that could get infected by HIV, and that is really uh, what we're aiming for. And then the, the patient would have, a, a, again, a blood and immune system that is resistant to HIV. And uh, I don't think I can use a pointer, can I? No. Yeah, that's, so you can see all the, that's okay. You can see all the cells um, are then resistant, uh, all the blood lineages are resistant to HIV. Okay, so how can this be achieved? Uh, I've shown you in the previous slide, we can modify the stem cells. Um, and currently, there's uh, really a couple of different mechanisms that we're pursuing. Uh, this is just a schematic. You can see how the, uh, uh, the, the HIV virus attaches to the cell membrane of the cell in, the, in patients. And you see that CCR5 co-receptor there. Um, and that's exactly how HIV gets into the cell. And that's also, uh, if, if that CCR5 co-receptor is missing, then these cells are resistant. And that's, a, again, that those were the uh, kinds of cells that um, Timothy Brown received uh, uh, with this uh, natural variant of CCR5 negative um, cells. Now, we can use, as I mentioned, different nucleases, and you've uh, just schematically shown here, uh, they're called tau effector nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, or uh, so-called homing and mega nucleases, uh, and knock down that CCR5 co-receptor. Or, as I also mentioned, we can use um, vector systems, so lentiviral vectors, and introduce, uh, for example, a fusion inhibitor. Um, this, for example, is we've got quite a bit of experience now with this C46 uh, peptide from the C-terminal of GP41, which inhibits both the R5 and the X4 strains of HIV. And so if we uh, in include this into a lentiviral vector and then introduce it into stem cells, we, we can also make stem cells and blood cells resistant to HIV uh, via this uh, HIV fusion inhibitor. So these are the two main uh, mechanisms that we're pursuing right now. Um, okay, so more specifically now, in project one, just want to highlight again what we're trying to accomplish and study is we'd like to figure out how much TBI and chemotherapy is needed to measurably reduce the latent HIV reservoir. Uh, and we'd like to compare you now whether we need uh, whether TBI total body radiation is sufficient or whether we need some additional immunosuppressive treatment like with this uh, anti-thymocyte globulin uh, that we've also been using and that um, uh, people with transplantation uh, have, been, um, uh, have been receiving. Uh, and we can also then study which viruses survive the uh, transplant. We can identify when and how HIV from latently infected cells in these uh, irradiated patients uh, 
uh, infects how these reactivated viruses can infect in autologous uh, uninfected cells. In project two, as I mentioned, this is the industry uh, partner Sangamo. Uh, here we will develop these zinc finger nucleases. And just to show you how this works, uh, schematically, again, uh, we induce a non homologous end joining, uh, eliminate the CCR5 site uh, with a target gene uh, disruption. Um, and again, this is really something that Sangamo has uh, uh, extensive experience in. And then in project three, we'd like to study uh, the engraftment potential of these cells in different systems. And one additional feature that we'd like to uh, study as part of project three is, now what if we don't have sufficient cells uh, that are now HIV resistant in patients? How can we increase the level of resistant cells in patients? Because we don't know whether we're gonna get, you know, whether we need 80, 90% resistant cells or 50% enough. Um, and then if the cells are in the patient, how could we increase those, the, the, the level of uh, HIV resistant cells? Now here we can, um, we, we can hopefully uh, incorporate, it's called homologous recombination, uh, combination. we can insert a gene into the CCR5 locus, and what we'd like to insert there is in fact a, a gene that will help us select for these HIV then resistant cells uh, in vivo, in patients. Uh, we've already have quite extensive experience with a system uh, that I don't have time right now to go into detail, uh, but I'd just like to briefly show here how it's working. Uh, so if we only have a few cells initially that contain uh, here the green cells with the P140K, and then apply a small dose of chemotherapy afterwards, we can in fact uh, increase the level and percentage of gene-modified cells dramatically and significantly, as shown schematically here with um, all the green cells after uh, this um, O6BG chemotherapy uh, treatment. And this is what we'd like to achieve here is the percent gene marking, now, if it's too low, uh, with this type of treatment, we hope we can increase it to the level that is required for efficient protection in patients um, with uh, HIV. Uh, so what do we think uh, here? What we've learned here already is that we, can we move this up the sharing part? Oh. Uh, so what we've learned here is that we, we, we can enhance the uh, immune response uh, to um, HIV using this approach. So simply by, um, just a schematic, simply by introducing HIV resistant uh, blood and stem cells, uh, we, we can enhance the uh, immune response, the cellular and uh, the uh, humoral immune response to uh, HIV via different mechanisms as you can see here. And I've, I've put this in by uh, Bruce Walker. Uh, this was uh, from last year in Scientific American. Uh, the uh, mechanism how uh, the elite controllers work, and we actually think uh, we, we probably can accomplish something similar. Uh, now, not with the um, HLA type here, but by protecting now the uh, generals, the CD4 cells with our um, key, with our um, uh, gene therapy, we can actually help now coordinate the foot soldiers, as he calls them, the CD8 cells, to eliminate those HIV-infected uh, cells. So we hope we can accomplish something like this in uh, patients who are not elite controllers, so do not have that particular HLA type. Okay, and I think um, Keith will talk about um, his project, Project 4, and will he talk about Project 5 as well? Let's talk about some delivery issues. Yeah, yeah. and then um, Project 5, um, Keith will also talk to you a bit more about, um, but one mechanism for delivery is, um, that has been explored by our collaborator, Dr. John Grassi, is really using the so-called aptomers 
to target HIV-infected cells. And he's actually got some very nice uh, and, and very interesting results already by using these uh, small aptamers uh, or dendritic technology. You can see these are little small aptamer um, siRNAs. We can they, he can actually specifically target uh, target HIV-positive cells and hopefully deliver these nucleases that uh, <coughs> Keith and uh, others are developing. Um, and I think uh, then hopefully we'll be able obviously to eradicate any existing HIV in the patient because that will be important um, as well if you cannot eliminate it via uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or radiation. Okay, so this is where we are now. Uh, I think we have um, made quite a bit of progress. Allogeneic transplantation can cure HIV. I think we know that. Uh, now, certainly if we use the CCR5 negative cells, but mo as most of you know, uh, is there's also these, the Boston patients now, and I just came back from the San Francisco uh, meeting, and Dan Karitskas gave us an update at least up to uh, until recently, and uh, clearly, even without CCR5, our patients seem to be able to uh, stay in remission. You know, after their, the uh, treatment, the um, ARC treatment is discontinued. So that's also quite promising. So maybe, but it's not for sure yet, it's only two patients, maybe just the allogeneic effect, so the, that graft versus host or graft versus reservoir cell effect can in fact um, also eradicate HIV. But again, this is still early, and uh, I think we will hear actually more at uh, at the Miami meeting, um, uh, more follow-up on these patients. Now, again, then we can answer the question, do we need an allogeneic effect to eradicate HIV? And, and now, uh, obviously, what we'd like to learn, at least from what we already know in these patients, the Boston patients and Timothy Brown, is now, how could we apply this effect that we've seen now in a safer manner? As I mentioned before, we don't want patients who get graft host disease or severe graft host disease and all this. But I think we now at least know it, there's something there, and how could we now uh, exploit this um, and, and, and figure out a safer way of delivering this graft versus HIV reservoir effect. Then in the autologous setting, um, I think um, there's now several studies underway in the clinic already for patients with cancer and um, also for patients without cancer, um, those studies have just uh, gotten started as well. Um, there's significant, significant advances obviously now in cell engineering techniques that will facilitate the autologous uh, approach um, as well. Um, we don't know yet though whether this can cure. So we will need to learn this, obviously this is part of our uh, collaboratory, to learn whether autologous uh, uh, transplantation and genetic modification of autologous cells can lead to cure. And again, it may require a combination of vaccines and uh, the autologous transplantation of genetically modified cells and the uh, um, eradication of uh, integrated virus. Okay, so what are the studies in Seattle? What do we have here? We, in fact, we do have autologous transplantation studies for the treatment of uh, patients with um, AIDS lymphoma. So these are studies without genetically modified cells. Those are ongoing studies. We've got ongoing allogeneic transplantation studies for patients with lymphoma and leukemia and HIV. So these are patients who have uh, blood cancer and need a transplant at this point. We study and follow those patients. Um, studies to open soon, we do have, um, as part of, in fact, of a separate grant, uh, also a, an autologous transplantation protocol now with HIV resistant cells, and that study should uh, open uh, next uh, year. This is using this uh, fusion inhibitor that I just described to you, and we'd like to also expand this study uh, to a patient population uh, that uh, undergoes chemotherapy for AIDS lymphoma. And again, future studies will then include um, also uh, purging of T cells uh, with um, antibody therapies and purging CD4 cells with target radioimmunotherapy. These are particular strengths uh, of the Seattle uh, here. This is our Defeat HIV uh, website. And if you're further interested, you can also go to, onto our uh, HIV on trial website to learn more about the ongoing uh, clinical studies here in Seattle. 
And I think this is uh, one last slide, just to uh, show you some of the um, other studies that we plan on uh, uh, initiating here in Seattle, again with the autologous, uh, in the autologous transplant setting using gene-modified autologous cells. We already have uh, um, several studies um, planned. Then uh, there's also potential core blood studies. We can, if the core blood is not CCR5 negative, obviously core blood cells can easily be made CCR5 negative, also with genetic modification. And then one other um, potential interest is obviously, do we need to make allogeneic cells CCR5 negative or um, HIV um, or, or protect them from HIV infection? This will also be something that um, we're interested in studying here. And um, then uh, could one extend this also in a haploidentical setting? That means uh, getting a transplant from somebody who's not, uh, who, who is not uh, entirely matched. Uh, that would obviously be, uh, ex expand the potential donor uh, population dramatically because any sibling <laughs> has a donor. And I think with this, I, I'll stop here. And how do we do this? Questions now. It's be a great time yeah. for you to take some questions. Yeah. Out, Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Keem. Uh, Dr. Keem, unfortunately, will have to leave us a bit sooner than later before the uh, webinar is over. And so if you have questions with regard to his presentation, this would be an ideal time to ask him uh, as we have him here for a few more minutes. So I'm going to open up for a few moments for questions uh, if anyone might have with regard to his presentation. Um, this is David Evans from Project Inform uh, and the DARE Collaboratory. Um, one of the questions that I've heard frequently expressed when uh, Timothy Brown's case is, is talked about in particular is, you know, the role of the various compartments of the virus and what um, allogeneic and, and, and um, uh, 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 autologous stem cell transplantation can do in terms of reaching all of those compartments. Could you talk about that just a little bit? Oh, absolutely. It's obviously a very, very good question. And that was exactly the question now that we <laughs> asked ourselves when we put that collaboratory together. Obviously, there's, there's um, um, at least three components. So there's the, um, the radiation chemotherapy uh, that, uh, that Timothy Brown uh, received. Then there's the allogeneic uh, cells that he received. And then there's the CCR5 negative cells that he received. Um, Act, when we uh, put the collaborator together, I think most of us thought we needed the CCR5 negative cells. Uh, this is obviously why we, um, why we initiated our uh, studies here, uh, using genetic modification to introduce uh, a uh, knockdown of the uh, HIV do doorway, the CCR5 uh, co-receptor, co or introducing the uh, C46 fusion inhibitor. So we clearly thought this was a critical component but then, as you also know, then uh, the Boston group um, published and uh, presented their results in two patients now that uh, received um, donor cells from a CCR5 wild type uh, donor. That means uh, regular donor cells without any particular HIV resistance uh, mechanism or feature. And again, if these patients remain um, without HIV, then off art therapy, then the uh, aloe effect could potentially be sufficient uh, in, in, in uh, inducing a uh, elimination of the reservoir and, and cure. But as I mentioned before, even if this were the case, and these patients are now long-term uh, also free of HIV, this is a fairly involved and still risky procedure and could not be uh, applied to the general population, that is, to patients without, to HIV positive patients without blood cancer. So we would still need other, make other ways of, of, of introducing this CCR5 resistance or getting rid of, of the reservoir. And then the other question is, how much can chemotherapy or radiation by itself eliminate, eliminate the reservoir? Because that was also the question, how much would that contribute to, uh, to Timothy Brown's elimination of the reservoir. 
that was also um, unclear. And this is also some of the things we'd like to study here, since we have non-myoblative transplant studies here and myeloblative transplant studies. So non-myoblative means low-dose chemo chemoradiotherapy, and myeloblative, myeloblative means high-dose, uh, simply, you know, high-dose radiotherapy and um, chemotherapy to eliminate the cancer, but also potentially eliminate the reservoir. That answer your question? It does. Thank you. Dr. Kim, can you just really quickly, uh, we hear the uh, term CCR5, uh -huh. and it sounds like it's a, a, a very uh, crucial piece to this puzzle here of eradicating HIV in just regard to a contracting virus. Can you just simply explain the importance of CCR5 and what it is? Uh, you said some, there's CCR5 deletion. Some folks don't have CCR5. The majority of us do. Can you help us understand that? Well, I, I may want to go back to that slide. If you can just go back. Um, let me just go back all the way to that, to that slide with the entry door. That was probably best. Here. Here we go. As you can see, so HIV uh, cannot, will need that CCR5 co-receptor to bind specifically to this receptor. And there is about 1%, mostly northern European uh, people, who actually have a, a, who do not express this CCR5 co-receptor. So they have a genetic variation that will, makes them not express this CCR5 co-receptor. And therefore, in about 1% of patients or people, in especially of uh, northern European descent, they are resistant to HIV. Now, fortunately, we know exactly where this uh, variation, genetic variation, sits in the chromosome. So we can introduce this very easily by genetic manipulation in cells, in stem cells or T cells, and then make cells resistant to HIV. That has been, uh, I think, very well studied now. And so now, with Tim, in the case of Timmy Thierry Brown, is, does he have that CCR5 deletion? Yes, he, he does not, now yes, have that. He does, uh-huh. Because yeah. of the transplant. Because of the transplant, exactly. Okay. Other questions? Thank you so much for your question. Other questions here before we uh, move on? Uh, hi, this is Stephanie, and um, I asked a question if you could explain what uh, allogenetic and autologous, I can't say, yes, yeah. means. Good job, <laughs> Stephanie. Good job. We were, I was having a hard time as well, so thanks for saying it. So allogeneic just means from a different donor, and this is, uh, let me go back to the slide here, the first slide. So here, this is uh, the patient. Uh, let me go back one more. Uh, here we go. So as you can see, we take the cells in the allogeneic, again, that sim simply means from a different uh, person, called donor here, we take from a donor the cells, the marrow cells, marrow stem cells, uh, or blood stem cells, and infuse those into the patient. So from a different um, donor, these, the cells are taken and given to the patient. The autologous simply means from the patient, him or herself. So patient cells are taken, modified uh, outside of the body uh, in the tissue culture uh, dish, or a flask, and then return to the patient. So it's the same person. Therefore, there's no graft versus host or graft any, any side effects from the allogeneic, from the donor cells. Stephanie, does that answer your question, or do you need clarity? Great question, by the way. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I, th I think it does. I'm just wondering, um, would would you have any, like we know with the other one, it's graft versus host and you, and you can have rejection issues. Um, do you anticipate having any type of issues or problems with uh, reinfusing the, the new cells with, um, that have been changed into the body and, and having the, um, your own T cells attack them um, instead of them helping them? Oh, very good. No, no, we don't expect that um, at all. There, I mean, the worst that could happen, again, if there was a recognition of the particular change in the cells is that they are being rejected. But that is very unlikely um, since these are the patient's really own cells and, and all we do is we modify the CCR5 and we know CCR5 negative cells can engraft. So that would be unlikely. Um, the, the only question with the autologous 
a part is how much conditioning do we need to get these cells to engraft? And that is a big question right now. So how, how much chemotherapy or radiation therapy do we have to give patients to get these cells, the patient's own cells, then to engraft efficiently? Does that help? Uh, yes, and I guess a secondary question to that would be um, when running chemotherapy, you would still run the, the risk of infection then, correct, the same way you would as a, as a bone marrow transplant? Not the same way less because with the allogeneic, you always have that, that attack, the donor cells attack the host, which increases the, um, the immunosuppression and the, the potential for in also infectious complications. So yes, with the chemotherapy, there could also be immunosuppression and, uh, and potential for infections, but less than with the allogeneic. So that, that will always be less than with the allogeneic. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Dr. King, thank you so much for ask, ask, answering the questions there. I'm going to reintroduce you to uh, Dr. Dr. Keith Jerome, and he's going to uh, uh, facilitate his presentation, and he will also be available for questions after as well. So with no further ado, Dr. Keith Jerome, thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Hans-Peter. That's always interesting to hear. Um, so Hans-Peter told you a lot about what's going on now. What are the studies that we're doing now? What are the approaches that patients are in our healthcare facilities um, undergoing? Um, and so in the second part of the talk, I'll maybe tell you a little bit about some of the more forward-looking approaches that we're taking to cure, sort of with the idea of are there ways to um, take a complementary approach that might work together with either the transplantation stuff you just heard about or maybe some of the reservoir purging uh, drugs that we've heard about from the other collaboratories, and maybe be a little bit easier to uh, actually uh, scale up as we think about bringing this to everybody around the world. So. The, as I mentioned, we have this sort of enabling technology of these rare cutting endonucleases, and as Hans-Peter sort of introduced you to, you can sort of think of them as, as molecular scissors that, that essentially can go into a cell and look for a very specific DNA sequence, and if they find it, they cut it. And there's different sorts of these, and I think we don't need to go into them too much in the kind of pluses and minuses of each. Um, the stuff that I'll show you today is predominantly with the type of molecule that's on the very right called a homing endonuclease. And my colleagues uh, here in, in, in Seattle, especially at Seattle Children's and here at Fred Hutch, Andy Scharenberg and, and, and Barry Stoddard, have really been studying these for years and they're interesting that they come from yeast. They come from, some of them come from bread yeast actually. Um, and we're now learning about something that just sort of exists in nature. So one yeast cell kind of uses them to fight against another, sort of. They, they cleave each other's DNA and stuff. But we're now actually able to take that thing and say, why in the world are you studying bread yeast? Well, now what we've learned from that, we can apply to a problem like HIV. So it kind of shows you how science can kind of take you in, in, in unpredictable directions sometimes. So we'll talk about those homing endonucleases. And what they basically do is they look for a very specific sequence. Here it's 20 or 22 letters. Remember, DNA has these A's and T's and C's and G's. And if they're in exactly the right order, then the DNA editing enzyme, the homing endonuclease, can sit down on there and it breaks the DNA. So you can see it break there. And most of the time, you see that line kind of at the left, everything gets repaired and everything is just completely fine and you'd never know anything happened except that, that enzyme is there. It, cleaves it again. It, it makes that cut again because it finds its site. And eventually what happens is you get a mutagenic event. That's down there at the bottom where you actually lose a few base pairs right around that cut. And so Hans-Peter and, and, and his group might try to use that to knock out that doorway, that CCR5 for HIV. Um, but what we thought about in our group is could we, instead of directing that toward the cell DNA, could we direct that toward a virus itself? Could we direct that toward HIV and HIV sequences or hepatitis B or herpes simplex or some sort of virus itself and try to knock that virus out? So if we think about HIV, right, you know, HIV integrates, right? I mentioned that earlier. So if HIV were infecting a cell, it comes in, it sees the cell chromosome here in orange. Let's see if my little simple, simple cartoon works. Uh, yes, and it puts itself in, right? That's an integration event I told you about. So it's now part of the chromosome. 
And the trouble is that that part, you know, this isn't the, the, the HIV that floats around in the bloodstream, but it makes that, right? So, you know, then, let's see. So it makes other copies, right? And these yellow ones are the ones that go out in the blood. They're the ones that make people sick. They're the ones that can go off and infect other people. And so all the drugs that we have sort of stop this process of making new ones, but they didn't know anything about this, right? So I sometimes use the analogy of gardening, you know, and if you, you know, just pluck the leaves off the top of the weeds, you never can get ahead of the game, right? But if you can go in there and pull out the roots, maybe you can take care of things. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Roman. Is that in the first slide, the blue, is that what would be considered latent? Yeah, so that's the latent, or provirus, people call it sometimes, right? So that's Harris the latent. Harris in Seattle asking the question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that that's very stable, and it, when people are on, on uh, suppressive antiviral therapy for years, they don't have any of the yellow ones floating around in the blood, right? Maybe maybe somebody's undetectable. Right. But if we look hard enough in the right places, we can still find that, that blue. That's the integrated proviral form. In the reservoir. In the reservoir, exactly. Right. So we'd like to do something about that. Um, and so again, uh, sort of in cartoonish form, we've got this thing that can make yellow copies. If I had a molecular scissors then that could cleave it, I'll make a cut in it, we'll lose a chunk in the middle, the cell will repair that chromosome because cells, uh, this is something that cells have to do and they're very good at, so they'll repair it, it'll put the two ends together, but now you don't, ha you have a little fraction of HIV left, some part of it, but it no longer can make yellow copies, okay, it is an inactive sort of a dead virus. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but much of our genome is actually made up of the remnants of old viruses that have infected us over the, evolutionarily, our ancestors, and eventually they've just kind of stopped being able to make new viruses. So the idea is could we speed that process up such that, you know, when somebody looks back at some day and say, oh, you know, there was this virus, it, it looked, you know, they, maybe they call it HIV, maybe they don't, and then something happened around, you know, 2015 or 2020 or 25, and suddenly the virus, you know, it lost a bunch of stuff in the middle of it and it's no longer able to make disease. We'd like to speed that process up and make that a reality for, for a treatment. So these are the homing endonucleases. These what they look like. So I've kind of taken you through the, the principles, and now we're going to get a little bit sciencey, but I'm going to try to just focus on the, uh, on the high points as we go through. So this is the molecular structure. We actually, my colleagues know where every atom in these molecules are when, the, when, 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 when it's built. And the gray kind of ladder thing you might you see at the bottom there, maybe you recognize that, because that's DNA. You may have heard of the double helix. It's like a twisted ladder. And so in yellow and blue up there is the protein actually sitting down on HIV, and if it sits in just the right way, it can cleave that, okay? So we're going to use that process. And w w we actually tested this a few years ago. I told you these things come from yeast, and, um, you know, HIV doesn't have yeast sequences in it. And so we didn't know whether any of this would work, but we decided to put some yeast sequences into HIV, basically. It was into an inactive kind of HIV, so it couldn't actually cause disease to anybody. But we put the yeast sequences in and just asked, would this thing actually be able to attack HIV? And the answer was yes. If you look up here, this is the, the letter sequence from HIV in red and green. And green is the part that the enzyme is trying, this is the yeast sequence we put in there, can it attack? And the answer is yes. If you look at all these little blanks where it has the dashes, that's because we've lost that genetic material. That's what we've cut out, basically. Occasionally you put something extra in, and that's just as bad for the virus. Any of that will destroy the virus's ability to, to cause disease. So we said this might actually be a good approach, and we were pretty enthused, but the trouble was, none of the enzymes we had actually recognized HIV. They were all specific for various types of yeast. Um, brewer's yeast and a bunch of other ones that uh, Aspergillus, Nigelans, that's actually a, a, a yeast that uh, people have chemotherapy sometimes get in trouble with after transplant. Actually, So again, we're actually using that against the disease. Sort of interesting how that all works. Um, so we needed to collaborate with folks to say how can we make uh, one of these things target HIV, and I'll probably go through this pretty quickly because it can start to get technical, but we actually look at 
all the letters of HIV, HIV has about 10,000 individual letters in its, in, its, in its sequence. And we just look at, at groups of 22 and say, do any of those sort of look like, bear any resemblance to, to the sequences that these things actually recognize in yeast? Okay. And we rank the ones that are closest. And these are the ones we've been working on. Uh, and I should say, uh, just to be sure I say the names, we're collaborating very heavily with Andy Scharnberg uh, at Seattle Children's and Jordan Jarger, who's at a, a, a company here, uh, Progenin in Seattle. And so together, uh, these are the three that we identified and then have started to work on. Um, so sites, this Paul S20 site that I'll show you a little bit later is in the integrase. So you might know that that's one of the proteins that HIV really desperately needs. And there are integrase inhibitors like raltegravir and so forth that, that some of you, you guys may be familiar with. Very powerful drugs. So if we can knock out the integrase, the ability of the virus to make integrase, the virus can't can't infect new cells. And essentially what, what my colleagues do is, is look at that, that, that picture atom by atom of how the protein actually sits down into the double helix of yeast and says, well, if that double helix had the, had the letters in it for HIV, what would I have to change on the protein to make it work? Okay? And so it's actually an atom by atom rebuilding of these, I mean, it's amazing stuff what these guys can do. And then they're tested to see if they, if they work by putting the sequence onto the surface of yeast cells here. So we take a whole bunch of these proteins that, that we think might work, we put them on the surface of yeast together with the target that they cleave, such that it'll fluoresce differently if this thing can cleave. So there's that double-stranded break, right? So if, we, if it's a cutter and it all works, this Purple comes away from the red. I'm colorblind here, but whatever. You can tell. So this one wouldn't be cutting. This one would. And you can actually see it. If we put this thing through the right instrument, ones that cleave go from this nice black line, and then all of a sudden you see the black and the purple separate, right? So that means those are ones that work. And so you can, you can literally screen millions and millions of these, and, 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 and Jordan and Andy have figured out how to do that. Um, and ultimately, through a lot of work, we end up here. And this is something that we're super excited about because this is the first set of enzymes that look like they can cleave HIV sequences within human cells. Okay, so these are not infected cells. These are cells that have had the HIV sequence put into them and just the little part of HIV that we're targeting. So again, they don't have virus in them. Um, but when you see these red dots go up, that's what we're looking for, okay? So one that doesn't really do anything sort of looks like this, but all these that have these red dots going up, and that's about seven of those picked out of, you know, thousands that we looked at. But those are the good ones, okay? Now, excuse me, Dr. Yeah. this is Harrison. <laughs> yeah. This process has not actually happened in a, a human being, correct? This, this is has not happened in a human not being. Not Yeah, no. Um, I'm going to show you Obviously. it happening in some human cells, human cells in a minute, but it hasn't happened in a human yet. And there are several hoops of... of proving safety and, and, and going through a regulatory process that, that we'll need to prove before we could start to develop a, a, a trial for this. Um, this, is, um, this is David Evans uh, again. I, I also have a quick question, which yeah. is, um, are you simultaneously looking for endonucleases that could um, splice into SIV or, or SHIV? just so that you could test this in animal, in, in primates first, or would you go straight into humans? Yeah, the answer is yes. So we have, we have developed enzymes for that as well. Um, okay. some, of these, some of these, I showed you three of them. A couple of them are actually conserved between uh, SHIV and the SHIV we're using here and HIV, so we can do that. And that's one of the, one of the trials that we'll need to do, absolutely. Uh, so sort of the pathway, David, forward. Um, we're just now introducing these things, and I'll show you how we deliver them, but we're just doing this in humanized mice at this point. Um, mm -hmm. The follow-up there uh, presumably would be uh, um, a macaque, and that would be the, the safety data that we would need in order to move into human trials. You know, so people right. often, you know, why does this all take so long, but the last thing we want to do is hurt anybody, so we got to make sure it's safe. Yeah, thank Did you. Dr. 
Thank you so much for your question, absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Rome, briefly, what are some of the barriers to actually doing this in humans? Uh, obviously, the safety is, is number one. What are some of the barriers? Can you kind of let us know some of the challenges that you're up against to actually do this in humans? Yeah, so one of the things is getting these proteins into the right cells um, where they need to go, and we've actually made a lot of progress from that, and I can show you some of that in a minute. That's one of the big things that we were very scared about. Um, just scared about in that we were afraid if we didn't have uh, an effective way to do it, none of this would be possible. Um, the other thing we've been concerned about um, is that th these proteins need to be absolutely specific to the HIV sequences and not cleave the human chromosome in other places. Okay. That could lead to some toxicity. Um, and so part of part of the safety data that we need to do is actually just introduce these things into an animal, a mouse in this case, and just let the mouse live its lifespan out and make sure it never gets sick, for example. So does it do okay? Um, those are the sorts of things that we need to prove. And those are those are pretty standard for any sort of um, new medication, and particularly a gene therapy application, they're, they're new. And so, you know, some of the things that Hans Peters told you about, the CCR5 modification, um, you know, those have been, those some of that has been done in humans, and so many of those hurdles have been passed already. We'll benefit from that, certainly, but they're different reagents, and we'll have to prove some of that again. Thank you. So I mentioned that delivery is really critical, um, and we've been using another virus for that. Um, uh, Project 5 is in our collaboratory is actually all about delivery uh, using synthetic uh, nanoparticles, and, and, and I won't show you data for that, but in my laboratory we've been using adeno-associated virus. This is a, a little tiny virus that actually can't do anything by itself. It has to live in the context of another virus, typically adenovirus, hence the name adeno-associated virus. Um, but it doesn't make anybody sick. Um, it, it, you, you would never know you had it, but it can get into human cells. And so what we do is essentially the take out all the viral genes and put in something we're interested in. And you can package all that into what looks like a viral particle, but it doesn't have any, it can't make any new viruses. It doesn't have any viral genes. Um, but it'll make the protein that we want to deliver. So if we put into there uh, our, this is really tiny, my apologies, but if we put in our homing endonucleases, which are here in brown, or fluorescent proteins, we can put that into cells and see how well this goes in. And we've been doing a lot uh, with this for a couple of other projects, I mentioned in passing hepatitis B. If we put this into uh, liver cells and try to make them red or green, you can see you can do that very, very efficiently. So it's very good at going into liver cells. We've done this for um, herpes simplex infections. You might know that herpes infects the mucosal surface but then goes into the nerves. And we've been able to show that if you introduce AAV into the area that is where herpes infects at a mucosal surface, AAV actually travels down the neuron and, and expresses this gene in the neuron. And neurons have this classic pattern where they're kind of got these branches coming off. And so this is a neuron from a mouse that we've been able to do this in. So this is actually in vivo work here. Super exciting. And since AAV was working so well for these projects, we asked whether it might work for HIV as well. And the shorter answer is, at least in the model system, it transduces extremely well. So we're trying to make cells green. These are SUPT1s, which is a classic cell we use in the lab that can be HIV uh, infected. Um, and really at very low amounts of, of AAV, these are low numbers for AAV, you can get over 99% of the cells we call transduced, just means the gene's in there and, and making its protein. Um, I'll skip that one. And then just sort of as an example of the inter-collaboratory uh, work that, that I mentioned before and how important it is, we collaborated with Vicente Planeas um, at, at Utah um, from one of the other collaboratories. And I always forget which one. I apologize. <laughs> but thank you. Um, and uh, Vicente has, has a very nice model that isn't the cultured cells in the lab that have been in the lab for years. But these are actually a way to take cells right out of a patient and turn them into the central memory T cells, that is the reservoir cell, the critical cell. And so we were able to do that uh, with Vicente's help. And you can infect them with HIV and make it reactivate. It's a wonderful system. And if we do that, you can see that this, these AAVs are, are incredibly efficient at transducing those 
uh, much more natural cells uh, than we had tested before. So we're very enthused about AAV as a potential delivery mechanism. Um, so I just want to show you one bit of data that's, that's very new and we're very enthused about this. I showed you some data about this S20 site and I said, oh, this is in the cells that we've kind of artificially made to have you know, a, a short segment of HIV in them and it seems to work. Um, but we did a few more tricks with this enzyme. I think I won't go into the technical details, but to kind of start to ramp up how it works partially. And what we're able to see is that if we use HIV infected sub T1 cells, now these are human cells that actually do have real HIV in them, and we're able to now cleave HIV. That's indicated in the first bit by this little band right here. And I love to say you know, scientists get so excited about a little, you know, a little gray smudge on a picture like this, but we were thrilled. And so we went in and sequenced the cells that this came from, and here are those mutations that we saw before, okay, that we saw in our model system two and a half years ago. Now we've got it actually against HIV in human cells. And so we're doing all of our tricks that we've got and already proven to, to ramp up the efficiency of this, and we're, we're just incredibly excited now having a delivery system and something actually to deliver that can do this. Um, uh, effectively against HIV. So really three points here. You know, I think we can target the latent genomes. It can actually be very efficient. I didn't show you some of the greatest efficiency data, but, but it certainly can work extremely well. Um, delivery is very important, and at least at this point, we're very enthused about AAV for, for all the projects in the lab, including maybe HIV. And one of the things we're doing now in uh, in expanding our, our collaboratory is actually looking at that now uh, in these mouse models. As I mentioned, those studies are underway. Um, we're collaborating with uh, Paula Cannon um, down in California as part of our collaboratory, and um, we should have some data with that very soon. And just like Hospita, there's tons of people to thank. I think I mentioned a lot of these people along the way, and many funders <laughs> helped very much. And that is it for me. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Keith, at this point, we're just going to open up for uh, further questions um, from uh, Dr. Jerome's presentation. So if you have questions with regard to clarity around terms that were used or the process that he uh, mentioned with regard to cleaving, please take the time and ask now. We really want to encourage a dialogue and ensure that there's a comprehension about uh, what can be some pretty technical and um, heavily scientific procedures here. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. I know I have a few of my own. Hi, this is Michael. I have a question. What does AAV mean? AAV is adeno-associated virus. So it's this little virus that doesn't make people sick, but if you get infected with uh, an adenovirus or a couple of other types of virus, this little guy can come along for the ride, sort of. Um, and we take it and we take out all the innards of it, basically, and, and use it um, to deliver our gene therapies. It's incredibly powerful for that. You know, you guys may have heard that you can do a similar sort of thing. You can take all the coding sequences out of HIV or related viruses, right? Sometimes those are used as gene delivery vectors. Um, they don't have the, the genes for HIV, so they can't cause an infection, but they can help deliver another uh, type of DNA. So AAV is a, is a much simpler way to do that. Um, it's a little tiny virus. It's very easy to manipulate. And as I showed you, uh, it's very, very efficient at putting our genes into the sorts of cells that we want to get them into. This is Thank Jeff you, Taylor Michael. with a related question about that. Um, when using viral vectors, is there, like adenovirus-associated viruses, is there any danger of the immune system attacking that and therefore um, making it less effective? As well, there certainly, there certainly can be an immune response to AAV. AAV is very poorly immunogenic, so, it, so it, you have to kind of work at it to get an immune response. Um, mm -hmm. Some of us, many of us have been exposed to different types of AAV over the years, right. um, and it just varies from person to person. Um, and so many of us have pre-existing antibodies to AAV, and if we have those, it is less efficient. Um, that's been a problem and a, a very insightful question I've been asked many times. There's a really wonderful new paper out of the boss, one of the Boston groups um, that, that, that showed that in macaques, um, you can get around that problem simply by doing a, a relatively easy plasmapheresis uh, before you do this. You actually kind of 
take those antibodies out of the blood system right before you want to give this AAV, um, and then the AAV goes in quite effectively, and then the body remakes those those antibodies over a couple of days, and um, it, it works extremely well. So I actually think that's not going to be much of a problem, um, and, and certainly there's no danger in that. It just means that the therapy wouldn't work quite as well, but the presence of those antibodies is not pathogenic at all. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Keith, what is macaques? Macaques are are monkeys. There's a type of monkey. Um, so let's see what I don't know. Uh, rhesus. I mean, sometimes people have heard of rhesus monkey, monkeys. So that's a rhesus macaque. Um, there, it's a model system that's been used quite a bit in in HIV work um, because it can be infected with with viruses very similar to HIV and allows us to study therapies. Okay. My question with uh, regard to. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Who's speaking? This is Matt Sharp from San Francisco. Hi, Matt. Hey, Matt. Hi. Hi, Keith. Uh, I just wondering, how are these gene therapy approaches administered so far, and how would you project them to, as, you know, how they're going to be administered in humans? IV yeah. or? Okay. So that's okay. a great question. So um, as I'm sure you, you know, um, the 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 CCR5 stuff right now is all being done ex vivo. So a person, the cells are taken out of a person, they're modified outside the body, and then reinfused. Um, clearly, that's something that's going to be hard to scale worldwide, just because of the medical infrastructure that is needed to yeah. do that. Yeah. So what what we're what we're really going for in the in the delivery studies, whether it's with the adeno-associated virus, the AAV, or some of these um, nanoparticles that, that, that we just mentioned, um, would be something that, that wouldn't require a transplant, basically, or any kind of you know, uh, plasmapheresis or, or any of that. So it would be pretty simple. The idea would be an intravenous shot. And in our, that's what's going on in our mouse studies now. They're just going into the veins. And the question is, how effectively can they find the HIV reservoir. Um, that, that's wow. Really that's, a, that's very exciting. So it would just be a, a shot in the vein, basically. That would be the long-term goal. Because, again, okay. so we wow. want to have a cure for everybody, right? Not just if you're right, right. in a rich country. That's, exci that's exciting news. I didn't know that. Thanks. This is Paris in Seattle. Keith, would, as we know, there's inflammation of the arteries with the presence of an infectious disease such as HIV. With this, the uh, cleaving process there, would there be, uh, would arteries still be affected, in fact, in respect of them being inflamed? With, you know, we'll look at the case of Timothy Ray Brown. Is he still suffering the effects of inflamed arteries in his in his, I guess, eradicated state of HIV? That's a really great question, Paris. Um, I think just to be honest, I don't know the answer. I think we can't really know the answer to that till we get a little ways down the path. One thing that we're certainly doing in the studies even now in, in the in the mice is ask questions about inflammation, um, and it's it's harder because they're not people, um, right. and and so it's a little bit difficult to do there. But we're certainly very aware of that if we can get all this to work, ultimately we may need to learn whether there are aspects of e even a defective virus and, uh, that that are still causing some of that inflammation you know, as you may know a lot of the a lot of the proviruses in the body seem to be defective right that they can't actually make new virus um, but it's not it's not completely clear that they're completely harmless and so there may be specific areas we need to knock out you know to to prevent that and we might be able to prevent any new virus from being in the blood but there could still be in which case, you know, I would love to have that problem because it'd be mean we're really affecting the disease and we're right. getting down to, you know, additional aspects. Right, right. Yeah, it's been on my mind. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions, folks? Thank you so much for the questions that have come through. They've been great questions. And again, obviously, thank you, Keith, for responding. Other questions that you all might have, they're on the webinar. If there are questions also about what Hans Peter talked about, you know, I can certainly take take a stab at those as Absolutely. well because we we do work very closely together. Absolutely, thank you. 
Hi, um, just one final question. So this is Stephanie. So I know that Hans Peter's um, research is going to be done um, using people that have cancer, but what about um, uh, Keith's research when, when, when you're doing that? Will that be with people with cancer or could that be for anyone? Um, I think that'll be for anyone. There's no there there's no uh, ahead of, there's no reason ahead of time that people have to have cancer for that. The reason that people have to have cancer for you know Hans Peter stuff that's going on now is it's a very complex and uh, process and requires a transplant and there's there's toxicity and when people need to go through that to cure their cancer, if we can cure their cancer and at the same time cure their HIV, that's a wonderful thing. Um, but right now, I think it's too much toxicity purely to try to cure HIV itself um, when there are alternative approaches at this point with medication until we get all this simplified. Um, but if it comes down to it simply an, you know, a, 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 an intravenous infusion you know, one time or a couple of times with no toxicity, then sure, we want to provide that to everybody. That's that's wonderful to hear from a 28-year survivor. So the the yeah, the thought of maybe in my lifetime having a, a possibility of a cure um, without me having to have cancer is a wonderful thing. Yeah. So I'm pushing and praying for for the research to be successful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, we're all working on that, and we're working hard and as fast as we can go. And it's frustrating, obviously, for everybody that it that the pace is what it is. It's just such a difficult disease uh, and science is so inherently difficult because it's the unknown. Um, so believe believe me, we're we're all working at this just as hard as we possibly can. can oh, and I believe that. I mean, I, I didn't mean that as any slight in any in any way. I'm, we've come leaps and bounds from the time that I was first infected and so the amount of research and the technical um, leaps that we've made for HIV has been tremendous. I never thought I'd see the point where we'd even talk about cure, let alone have it be um, a possibility or even within the grasp. So I'm just in all, all of all of the researchers who are doing this work and I'm very hopeful for the future, if not for my generation, for generations to come. So it, just, it, it really gives us all hope. All of this cure research gives us all hope and we're, I just thank you for that. Great. Yeah, I guess along those lines, uh, Keith, I'd ask you, you know, when we do find a cure here, who, in your opinion, is going to be the first to receive this? I what think, communities? Yeah, so I, I think what we're going to see, I don't think there's going to be a day when the cure comes. I think the cure is going to be a process. And we've, we're already seeing that, right? We have Timothy Brown, right. clearly cured. And that's and that's where we started, right? And now we've kind of got these these Mississippi babies. There's these group of folks who've had these transplants um, in Boston, and and actually there's some in some other places um, who are probably cured, maybe cured. You know, this is also when do we know? You know, when do we know that somebody's cured? Um, but we're optimistic, we're hopeful about those folks. So you're going to see this sort of rolling cure over years. So I suspect that, that it will become less rare that people are cured. It, so the first ones will be the, the folks in these cancer studies. It'll be the folks here um, at some other centers as well. Um, they can be the people who are very, very sick from it. Um, and and then I think, I think we're going to run into a, a period where scaling it to everybody is going to take a lot of hard work. And I think that all the collaboratories are – whether it's the, the HDAC inhibitors or our approach, I suspect we're all going to run into difficulties that we can't even foresee now. And that's just been my experience in science, and it takes us time to work through those, and then we, we move forward. So I think some people will be cured. If we get the sort of things that we're talking about here, and it really works, then I think, then it, and I'm talking about the, you know, the, the res, targeting the reservoir with the homing sure. interfaces or something like that. Then I could see. I suspect that things would move very quickly at that point if we actually showed it was safe and it was. I think there would be a worldwide outcry that it can't just be for the United States. And I know Gates Foundation they they've supported this work already, and I think they would at that point when it was ready to deliver. Right. And I think the U.S. government's been very proactive too in a lot of ways worldwide. So 
I, I think it would be available to everybody in a relatively short period of time. Thank you uh, so much. This yes, is uh, Jeff Sheehy. Could I ask a couple of questions? Sure. So first, um, um, both about Hans Peter's work, actually. So, so uh, the first question: Are you use, are you using the AAV vector and uh, to deliver those? Um, no, not at this point. That's being done mostly with uh, RNA transfections. So it's a, just a different approach, um, and, and it's easier because you can take the cells out of the body and in and get the genes in in a, in a test tube or a, a tissue culture dish and put them back in. So it's actually a much easier problem when the cells are just sitting in front of you in the lab. And then, and then the second question, um, don't you worry about going into cancer patients um, when, I mean, your main safety issue is oncogenesis, <laughs> off-targeting? I mean, you're, people already have cancer. <laughs> and your fear is, I mean, that you're going to off-target and you're going to create cancer. Um, well, certainly, we're, we're always aware and we never want to cause cancer or any kind of malignancy. Um, I guess maybe one, one way to respond to that, if you think about traditional therapy for cancer, you know, well, the first drug, cyclophosphamide, that, that people have used for 55 years for cancer, maybe more, very well known to be oncogenic. And in fact, I mean, tragically, many of these children who get cured of childhood malignancies end up having a cancer later in life that's probably due to the drugs they had to take to cure their first cancer. So it is something that we really think about. Um, you know, the folks who go to transplant have already failed therapy for their leukemia or lymphoma. They've failed a traditional therapy. Uh, which means the cancer has come back after they've had chemotherapy, and they need to get a bone marrow transplant. And so, um, you know, I think that the additional risk, there's there's been no evidence of any additional risk for any of these manipulations of the cells ex vivo uh, targeting the CCR5. So it's something that we're always looking for, um, and clearly if there was any indication that there was an additional risk, we'd, ha we'd, we'd, we'd want to stop, but um, at this point, we haven't seen anything like that. So you don't think it's problematic that other studies are going into people who don't have cancer? I mean, I, I guess I, you know, and and, uh, and do you, don't you think it presents some engraftment problems? I mean, aren't they pretty well depleted, well, I, I, especially in lymphoma? Uh, I, maybe I'm missing the point of your question, but the folks, the, all the transplant studies and sort of stuff Hans Peter's doing, that's only in, in cancer patients, and we wouldn't be doing any bone marrow transplant type. No, but I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're going to transplant modified cells, right, autologous modified cells. I mean, other studies are, are going into patients who yeah. don't have cancer. Okay, yeah, I got you now. Okay. Um, well, I think, I, you know, I, I would need to review the informed consent on that, but I, 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 I'm confident that that's one of the risks that, that's discussed. I mean, it would absolutely have to be. I mean, you're absolutely right. All, all I can say is that from, you know, from the point of view of the investigators, I believe that they, they would feel like that is a, a small risk and that the risk benefit is, is, you know, there's enough benefit in their opinion to outweigh the risks enough that they can ethically suggest this and, and offer this to an individual who, who ultimately has to choose for themselves, you know, what what they how they weigh those risks and benefits. I mean, there's, that's actually a whole area of research that's very very interesting, and maybe some of you guys have been involved in some of that. Is you know, for for the possibility of a cure what is an appropriate level of risk that you're willing to take. Um, and, you know, every, we all want to be very upfront and, and, and talk about this. We are moving into the unknown, and it's certainly possible that there could be problems. You know, I don't think anybody should tell you otherwise. Hi, this is Stephanie Dio again. Um, just a question, and I don't know, you may not even have the answer to this, but just something to put out there on the radar. I'm just wondering, as we're doing all this cure research and, and with, between the three collaboratories and the ACTG and, and IMPACT, if we are looking at differences between ethnic backgrounds and um, between sexes and with transgender folks to see if there's going to be differences in acceptance or um, rejection 
or how the difference in hormone levels um, may play out or the differences um, between ethnic backgrounds and, and the way that the, the, the bodies work, if, if any of that's going to be played out or if it's being taken into consideration at all? I think this will be the, and thank you so much for the question, this will be the last question as we're nearing the end of the call here. So after Dr. Jerome answers the question, we'll have to wrap up the call. Thank you for the question, okay. Dr. Jerome. So, uh, so thanks, Stephanie. I think there's probably maybe two questions wrapped in there. First of all is sort of the questions okay. around acceptability and risk-benefit considerations in, in all those different groups. And, and I know that that sort of uh, work, that sort of question is being evaluated in a number of studies um, that, that are really, you know, quite nicely done. And I think uh, some of the folks on the call actually have been involved in some of that work. Um, and can probably address that better than I could, and maybe that's something we can talk about in Miami. Um, in terms of the the actual studies, in terms of hormone differences and whatnot in the in, in the curative therapies themselves, you know, I'll tell you quite frankly, there haven't been enough people in the studies to to get any sort of you know useful data for that. The the designs of all the studies, as you know, are very um, are, are, are very cognizant and actually required to be to ensure that you know people of, of all different uh, groups are 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 enrolled uh, and represented in those so that we can get at questions like that. But you know it really takes typically dozens, hundreds of thousands of patients to really tell those sort of differences, which can be subtle sometimes. And so you know I suspect we're going to know that, but it's going to be several years till we have a really good answer we can be confident in. Thank you, Dr. Great. Keith Jerome. And we, thank you so much for your question, Stephanie. Absolutely great question. We've come to the end of our call today, and I want to thank our audience and all those who've joined us today for our, our webinar. I obviously want to thank Dr. Keith Jerome and Hans Peter Keem for their time and taking time to answer questions today. Very insightful discussion. As well, we'd like to thank the DARE and CARE CABs. Thank you for your contribution and joining us for this call. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Tom Andrews, who has facilitated us on the technical side of making sure that you have something to see on your screen uh, for this webinar. So we webinar thank you for your help with that. And also, lastly, our members of the Defeat HIV CAB, thank you for your contribution, uh, and it's a joy to work with you. With no further ado, we'll end this call, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. And we'll let you know when our next webinar will be coming out. Enjoy your day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.